Welcome to Hopkins at Home. So this week is the uh, third week in our mini course on quantum sensing. Um, where we'll be discussing atomic clocks. Uh, a rough agenda is we'll talk a little bit about how we've measured time. Discuss the quartz oscillator, uh, which is still, even with atomic clocks, you'll see it's still a critical instrument. <clears throat> and we'll discuss three types of atomic clocks, um, the hydrogen maser, the rubidium clock, and the cesium clock. And then we'll close with how atomic clocks are used with uh, GPS and get a sense of why you need an atomic clock for GPS. So back to the slide I really like. Um, today, well, it'll, yeah, and if, you, and if you looked at that um, Wired article, you'll see where this photo came from. Um, so the systems we'll be looking at today, they involve quantization and to a degree coherence. So we're, we're saving entanglement for next week, the last class. But it's good just to kind of keep this as a framework for understanding how something's a quantum sensor and what about it and what advantage that brings. Our historical overview of measuring time. So on this chart, we have the clock accuracy or the timekeeping accuracy. Um, and it goes all the way to, that's milli, micro, nano, picoseconds. <clears throat> and um, for just a scale, the authors or the creators of this figure put in the accuracy you get over one day and seconds a day um, of the Earth's rotation. If you're to use that as your clock, that's how accurate of a clock it would be. So once a day, you'd lose a millisecond or a thousands, thousands of a second. So there are two lines. The, the dark line is indicating the accuracy if you use astronomical measurements, so motion of stars, um, planets. And you can see how it's improved with our techniques in astronomy, but it kind of flattened out the last century. The dotted line is our ability with clocks or, or measurement devices to keep time. And so you can see for, for centuries, um, it was rather poor and consistently poor than astronomical techniques. But that changed once we got the quartz crystal oscillator. And now we've exceeded by many orders of magnitude um, previous techniques through the use of atomic clocks. And that's enabled things like the internet, um, GPS, to name a few. So how are we measuring how good a clock is? It's this quantity called the Allen variance. So here, you know, you, you have time going by and you measure it once, you measure it again, measure it again, and you keep measuring it. <clears throat> and then you take something where you know you sum the diff the square of the differences and you divide by the periods the square of the period that you were looking at so this is something very similar if you've seen it before to like taking a standard deviation so you've got many measurements and you look at the differences of the measurements and you normalize it you do the square root sorry you do the square because you don't you know what something might be negative something might be positive you want to average that out. So you square it, and then you take the square root. And then you'll see there's this general structure to the Allen variance, where here, this is your calculation of the variance. And then this is that time period over which you're measuring. 
So say this is one second and that's one day. So every second you make a measurement of time. And then you look at the Allen variance for one second. And then for one day, every day. So you have to do it for multiple, multiple days. Um, so these are different kinds of noise. I won't go into those, but white noise just means that um, it's noise which doesn't go away if you average more. It's just consistent over the time periods you measure. And then flicker noise is the opposite of that. Um, you can average that away. So we're going to skip all the stuff before quartz oscillators because none of them are relevant for atomic clocks. But a quartz oscillator, you'll see, is still relevant for atomic clocks. So how does a quartz oscillator work? Well, quartz crystals are piezoelectric. What that means is if you apply a voltage to it, it'll oscillate mechanically, it'll vibrate. And if you put pressure on it and you force it to vibrate, it'll give you an electrical signal, it'll give you a voltage. And there are different ways that you can oscillate quartz. You know, this is one of, you know, this is like our first instinctual way. You, 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 you squeeze it, it expands. You squeeze it, it expands. But in this way, you can bend it. And in this way, you can push it on the edge and then it moves like that. And all these different ways of how you excite the quartz but also how you cut the quartz out of the crystal defines its quality as a resonator. So these different cuts and these different modes of it might be more complex, but the reason why you do that is, for example, the temperature stability. So you see for these different cuts, um, some special cuts, you have an easy way to regulate the temperature because either it, the frequency shifts up or it shifts down for the AT and the GT cuts. And so a high quality quartz oscillator that's used for an atomic clock or for scientific instrument, it's typically kept in an oven or it's, um, it has a calibration with temperature and temperature is continually measured and it's adjusted based off that calibration. But that's still the same quartz oscillator that we have in most of our watches, essentially. And the reason why it's such a good oscillator is it has something called a high Q. What a Q is, is like for a resonator, the ability to store energy. I don't know if you have the familiar experience with different glasses. Or say you have a glass, you know, filled with wine to some degree versus an empty glass. Um, try it out sometimes. As you fill up the glass, it's harder to sustain an oscillation by, you know, wetting your finger and running it around the rim versus a, an empty glass. And because you're changing the length of it, you change the tone, but you're also changing the cue of it because you're dampening it with all that stuff in there. It's not free to oscillate. So one more slide on quartz, and then we're getting into atomic clocks. So how it works, um, here's a circuit. I know you're not gonna understand all of it, but the things you take away out of this is you apply a voltage to get it to oscillate. Um, this is just an amplifier. And then you divide down the frequency. So it's oscillating at 30 kilohertz. On your watch, you're gonna look at things at one second, right? That's what you care about. So that means you need to keep dividing that frequency until you have a period of one second. So you have to divide it like um, with the frequency divider. And it's just a electronic component which takes one frequency and keeps dividing it. Oh, how, then this is exactly how you use the oscillator to run the clock. So you divide it down till the period you want, which is one second. And then every second, the circuit's going to send a pulse out, which will then, you know, um, change the indicator on an LED or have the, the watch dial move. 
So that's the fancy electronics, but it's useless without that quartz oscillator. Because that quartz oscillator has to have a very stable frequency because you're not gonna change what the frequency divider does. That's fixed. So this has to be fixed so that this is always giving you one second. And as I'm assuming many of you have experienced, I've noticed it. So you define the resonant frequency of the quartz by how you cut it. And that's right. How do you know you, you, you get out of that circular loop by having standards, right? So we know for the meter, it used to be defined by this piece of metal in Paris. Now we have a different definition. So you have to have a fundamental calibrated way of defining these quantities. So what is one Hertz? Well, we've defined one second in terms of, you'll see when we get to cesium, the number of cycles of an atomic transition. And that's our definition. And then you use that device to calibrate other timekeeping devices or frequency devices. And then you would use that in your quartz factory to properly cut your quartz so it's at a specific frequency. It resonates at a very specific frequency. That's a good question. So the question is, does this mean that the crystal would be inaccurate if the current applied were inconsistent? Um, it would mean that the circuit wouldn't work very well because you wouldn't get the same oscillating voltage off the crystal. The amplitude would vary, but you should still get the frequency right. Um, because it's kind of like with a wine glass, you know, you hit it and it just rings at the frequency it rings at. How you hit it doesn't, as, you, as long as you hit it reasonably, doesn't change its ringing. You just have to hit it. So with the Allen variance, so this is a really fancy quartz oscillator because um, it's for a space thing. And you see it's minimum, so it means 10 to the minus 13. So what that means is at 10 seconds, it's gone off by one part in a millionth of a billionth, um, which is really good. But you'll see later when you go up higher in time, it shoots back up. And that's why also it's not a fundamental thing, right? The size of a piece of quartz isn't something fundamental. We want to define time in terms of something fundamental. This will make for interesting questions, hopefully, towards the end. So what atoms do we use for timekeeping? Hydrogen, rubidium, and cesium. And they all happen to be in the first column of the periodic table. There's a reason for that. Hydrogen has one electron. Rubidium and cesium are kind of hydrogen-like because they have closed electron shells, and then they have one little guy hanging out outside. So you can kind of consider them as being like the hydrogen atom, and you're going to manipulate states of that outer electron for an atomic clock. Also, they're, they're pretty cheap, and they're safer than potassium or sodium. Um, lithium, don't know why it's not used, just isn't. So here's the basic diagram for all of the clocks. This is the big kind of control diagram. You have your atomic resonator, which has a certain transition frequency, which then that frequency goes into feedback electronics which regulates a quartz oscillator, which then gives you a driving frequency that goes back into the atomic resonator to drive it. And you'll see in the examples, we have like an error signal that comes out of the atomic resonator, which then controls the feedback electronics. So you, you got a circle there, uh, it's a control loop. And then there's our, our watch dial or indicator the quartz controls that. 
So what do you do in the atomic resonator? The first thing you do is you prepare the atomic state. You apply energy in the terms of like microwave energy at say a gigahertz or 10-ish gigahertz. And then you detect a change in the state of the atoms. And then you use that change to tune the frequency you're applying when you apply energy. So you get it to a point of stability. And that's when it's all tuned up and you're properly measuring time. We'll come back to this. One last thing we need before we start talking about specific devices. I didn't go into too much depth, but we talked about how the electron has spin. We talked about how atoms have spin. So now we're gonna discuss, well, how do you discuss the spin of an atom, which is made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons? So the electron, in addition to having spin, it has angular momentum associated with its orbit. We call them orbits for lack of a better word, but it's angular momentum state with, with regards to the nucleus. So the intrinsic spin we label S and it's one half for an electron. And then the orbital angular momentum depends on its energy level, but we're not interested, we're interested in transitions where the L, the orb, orbital angular momentum is zero or one. So you take the orbital angular momentum and you take the intrinsic spin, you add those together to get the total electron angular momentum, and then it's called J. And so J has the transitions of interest. J can be one half for L equals zero or one half and three halves for L equals one. Each nuclei have their own spin and their spin can be any number can be zero, not any number, it's quantized uh, in units of a half. So it can be zero, one half, one, seven halves, five halves. Those are the largest I've heard offhand, but. Um, and then you add I and J to get F, the total atomic angular momentum. This is important, F is important. So this is quantized, J, I is quantized, so F is quantized. Um, and here you see an example where I equals five halves and J equals one half. So then that means that F can have two states. It can be, in this case, four, or it can be, in this case, three. Sorry, two or three, did my math wrong. F is important because we're gonna be interested in transition. So F can take different values um, from minus F to F, quantized values. We're interested in transitions where F takes a value equal to zero. Those are known as clock transitions. And the reason is, is because once you start applying a magnetic field, these transition energies change. So you want a transition whose energy doesn't change much with the magnetic field. Because like we're coming to see, well, if that frequency, if that energy changes, then that's going to mess up our clock. It's not going to, a second's not going to be a second anymore. Rubidium's our first one. So here you have um, the value F, two different F values, F equals one and F equals two. And here you see the different MF values, depending on the value of F. So for F equals one, it's minus one, zero. That's a typo, that's supposed to be plus one. I just noticed that. This one's supposed to be plus one. And then for F equals two, it can be minus two, minus one, 
zero, plus one, plus two. So here we're applying a magnetic field. Once you start applying a magnetic field, those energies change, they spread out. But you see for MF equals zero, between MF equals zero, it's pretty flat for small magnetic fields. So with an atomic clock, you're gonna put magnetic shielding around it. But good question. What exactly do the values mean? Half of what? Um, it's kind of historical that we have the spin of the electron being one half. Because when people started measuring the spin angular momentum, they calculated it in terms of like what they knew from classical physics. And so the electron was considered to have an anomalous magnetic moment. Because if you were to look at it like a classical particle that was spinning, it's angular momentum was twice what it should be. Um, so it's for historical reasons that that's our measure. Just like, um, I'm not gonna cover it, but there's historical reasons why we define a second the way we do with cesium versus say with a hydrogen maser. Um, because cesium was the first to have very good uh, stability. But as you'll see, a hydrogen maser is much better than a cesium. So half of what? Um, half of a Bohr magnetron, which is a unit of angular momentum for the electron because it was anomalous. So back to rubidium. So how does it work? Well, we have our framework of, first we have to prepare the state. So we have a rubidium 87 lamp, just like we had in the past, neon lamps, hydrogen lamps, we have a rubidium lamp. And so now it's, it's emitting at the transition wavelengths between the L equals zero and the L equals one states. In front of that lamp, fortuitously, um, rubidium-85 has uh, an emission line which cuts out and cleans up the transitions to F equals 2. So the light you have coming out here <clears throat> is just the, um, the I equals 1 to the I equals 0 F equals 1 line. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we've state prepped by selecting um, F equals one, MF equals zero. And so then those atoms in this resonant cavity, so this is all light. All we did here is we cleaned up the light that we're using to excite atoms in a cavity and there's um, coils around it, and you apply microwaves at 6.835 gigahertz. And when that happens, the light will excite the atoms here up to these two levels. And when they come down, they get mixed between these levels, the populations, by the microwaves. And that's gonna change how much light you get here from the light that originates here. So you have an absorption of the light, which is optimized when you're at the right frequency. So if you're off that frequency, more light goes through the cell. If you're on that frequency, less light. So now you have an error signal, which with you can feed back to your control frequency. Because if you don't have you get, if you have a lot of light, you, you look for that minimum where you have less light. Now you get more light, I got to go back. So now you have a little place to stabilize and control. And that's how you know what the frequency is. Because this frequency of that transition in zero B field is fixed. <clears throat> 
So we've made the assumption that every rubidium atom, rubidium 87 atom is the same. And that seems to be a very good assumption because these devices work and we know they work because we've been able to apply them. So if it wasn't the case that every ensemble of rubidium 87 was the same, then you know, you'd make a, two atomic clocks and they wouldn't agree with each other. And then you couldn't do anything like GPS unless you did something really weird. There is a reason why rubidium is not our time standard and cesium is a, a, a legitimate reason. And it's that, um, and you'll see it later when we look at the Allen deviation plots for these different clocks, that cesium stays stable a lot longer and it, and it has a higher stability higher accuracy than uh, rubidium. And I think this is somewhat conceptually easier to follow. So instead of generating light, this all starts actually with a beam of cesium. I don't know if you remember the stern gerlach experiment from the first lecture, where you had the beam of silver um, and you passed it through some magnetic poles and it deflected the different charge states. And then you had that picture with like the two little things a long time ago. So, whoa. So um, you have a beam of cesium and this will have um, atoms in the F equals three and F equals four states. And these magnets act as a selector because if you're in the F equals three state, you keep moving down the beam line. Whereas in you're in the F equals four state, you get deflected and you get kicked out of the beam line. So if you're in the F equals three zero state, you keep moving. You go into this little area, part of the Ramsey cavity, where microwaves are applied of a frequency of 9.192 gigahertz. That manipulates the atoms, their spin states. Then it keeps going for a certain distance, and then you do that again. There's a reason for this, which we'll get back to. So now you've taken all of your um, three zero, you changed them into four zero, and now you've now you have a superposition of three zero four zero by what you did in the Ramsey cavity. So you let the spins kind of evolve. So you start with the spins in one state and you mix them up. And then now you kick out the three zero ones and you send your four zero ones to this detector, which when every atom hits it, that creates an electrical current um, I see the question. I'll go there in one second. And so then that electrical current is used to control the microwave frequency. So similarly with what happened before, in this case, you want to maximize the current. So now you're going to tune your microwave frequency to get the most current here. So you tune the frequency going into your Ramsey cavity to maximize your current. When it's maximized, then you know you're at the right frequency because you're manipulating that transition between those two states. You actually can come from the, the actual atomic change in state with a maser, and I'll explain that a little bit. There's two ways to operate a maser. What's a maser? I keep throwing that word around. It's just like a laser, but for microwaves. So it's lasers are light amplification through the stimulated emission of radiation. Same thing for masers. Maser was first invented. Um, let me check the time. We're good on time. Um, why are quartz crystals, and oh yes, respond? Well, they don't really respond similar to cesium um, because Cesium and rubidium don't put out 
uh, they, they resonate when they're driven, but they don't oscillate by themselves. I don't know, that's not a good different distinction. The, the reason why quartz, this piezoelectric has to do with the crystal structure, whereas these are just a vapor of, of atoms. Um, and, you know, you, the, the secret sauce of the atomic clock, and it's, it's easier to see with, um, where am I going? With rubidium, is it's these MF0 to MF0 transitions, which really don't depend on magnetic field. That's the secret of it. Because say you were to try to operate your clock here, between zero and zero out here with a magnetic field. If there's a little bit of magnetic field, your, your frequency is gonna change. Your frequency is not gonna be stable. So you, you really couldn't define a, a period of time with that because it would just be a function of the magnetic field. Very small magnetic fields would change it. Uh, how does resonate differ from oscillate? Oscillation is a more generic term than resonator. A resonator is a really good oscillator, and there are really poor oscillators out there too. Um, I think that's the difference. Uh, so I'm using it It's a, kind of as a very, very general term. Both of them, I'm not using them as very precise scientific terms. I mean, so from these two examples, you can see that basic idea that we drive the atomic system with a certain frequency, and then we get an error signal out of it, either a maximum or a minimum. And then we use that to tune that frequency that we're driving the atomic system with. So the atomic system is kind of our, our gauge on itself. Are we driving it at the right frequency or not? And when we, we know we're driving it at the right frequency when it's stable, and we know what that frequency is, the one part I'm leaving out is you can calculate what that frequency is supposed to be. It's known. Um, and you can know it with high precision. So I've kind of glossed over the math on that side of it. How do you calculate these frequencies? How do you know these are the right frequencies? It's not just known experimentally, but it's understood theoretically based off our understanding of the atom. Um, And we know them with very high precision, like to eight, nine decimal places, something crazy like that. So the hydrogen maser, maybe I was thinking of starting with this one. This one's kind of the easiest um, because there's less lines. And this arrow is supposed to extend to the middle there. So that's the maser transition, 1.4 gigahertz. Um, and oops, similarly, we have, it works with a magnet. So this is a passive maser. You can have an active maser where it's generating its own microwaves um, and you don't need to apply uh, magnetic, uh, a drive. This is a passive one where you do need to apply a drive. So here you state select, you select the F equals one, they come in here and then you drive it with a radio frequency field to drive the transition between those two states. And so then you, you, you tune the frequency of the drive to maximize the output. So kind of variations on a theme, if you've noticed, where you do a state preparation, 
and then you do a oscillation between two different states. And then that gives you a signal with which you can tune how you drive the two states. So this is the, the plot we've been building up to. It's the Allen deviation with time. It's logarithmic on both axes. So we're looking at the powers of 10. And so you see up here quarks, which its stability is best at about a second or 10 seconds. Um, rubidium, what we started out with, 10 to the four seconds, which I guess is like uh, about an hour. And then at about a day, um, you see cesium. And then we have the, the active and there's the passive maser. So the passive maser is much better with long-term stability between a day and a month, cesium between a day and a month. So now you kind of see a calibration chain or a circle, depending on how you look at it, you know, where these longer stability, higher accuracy clocks are used to control a piece of quartz. Um, but even these clocks, they need to be regulated because after longer periods, um, they're not as good at keeping time. Time in use, GPS. So GPS is a constellation of satellites that are about um, 20,000 kilometers above the Earth, pretty high up there. The radius of the Earth's like 6,000 kilometers, I think. So about four radii of the Earth out there. And the GPS signal contains the time of the transmission and the position of the satellite. So a GPS receiver gets that message and notes the time it arrived. When did that message arrive? And using that, they can calculate the distance. So how come we don't have an atomic clock in our phone? Well, because atomic time to that level is broadcast in two ways. It's, you know, many of you may have seen being sold atomic clocks. Well, I have an atomic clock wristwatch. There's not an atomic clock in there. What it is is that um, NIST, National Institutes for Standards and Technology, they broadcast over radio an atomic clock timing signal based off of an atomic clock. So your atomic clock wristwatch or clock in your home receives that signal and tells you the time. It doesn't have an atomic clock itself. Similarly, like your cell phone, I don't think it's receiving that specific signal, but it has a way of getting accurate time. And so then that difference in time, and it, and it takes every electromagnetic wave travels at the speed of light, which is conventionally called C. It's three times eight times 10 to the eight meters per second. So based off that difference in time and the speed of light, you know the distance between the receiver and the GPS satellite. And so then if you know how with GPS, you need at least four satellites. If you have enough satellites, then you can figure out all those distances and do the math to figure out where you are on the earth. So that's GPS in a nutshell. Um, so now we can ask, well, why does it take atomic clocks to do GPS? So we have a few problems we can work through. And we'll just, I'll give you some time to work through them. Um, before we do that, I would write down that equation, distance equals the speed of light times this time difference. And what the speed of light is, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So here are the three questions. If you want a position accuracy of one meter, what type of time resolution do you need? Um, assume the Allen variance. Well, you guys can read it yourself. So I will wait like 
two minutes and then you don't have don't feel obligated to work through it i'll work through it as well if you want to throw your answers out there feel free to no obligation so there's 60 seconds in a minute 60 minutes in an hour 24 hours in a day so you have 60 times 60 times 24 seconds in a day um 8.6 times 10 to the four seconds. So we have, so for question one real quick, our uncertainty in time, well, we look at the uncertainty we want in distance and we divide by C. What's the uncertainty we want in distance? It's one meter. So we divide one meter by C and you get three nanoseconds. We're just ballparking why you need that kind of sensitivity. So for the next question, um, we are given the Allen variance of an atomic clock and we're asked, what's our uncertainty and distance based on that? So we wanna know our uncertainty and distance. Well, that's C times that our uncertainty in time. To get that, we're given the uncertainty over um, one day. Well, how many seconds are there in a day? You multiply those two, that's our uncertainty in time. Then we multiply it by C to get our uncertainty distance, which is two and a half meters, which is about how good GPS is. So the last question was, say instead of using atomic clocks, we try to use a reasonable quartz oscillator that has like 100 times less uh, accuracy. Well, then we get 100 times less um, precision in our distance measurement. And I would argue GPS like that is essentially useless. Why would we have a constellation of satellites for 250 uh, meter resolution? Probably wouldn't. Um, so now I'll get to the questions. Wouldn't, the next question is, wouldn't the distance between the satellites come into the accuracy calculation if they are further away from each other? Shouldn't absolute time resolution matter less assuming the satellite position is well known? So that's a very good question. How well is the satellite position known? Um, and what's the distance between the satellites? So I think they're divided up into six different orbits. So there's like four in an orbit. So you can divide an arc. That's at 24,000 kilometers. So you can say they're about 24, roughly 24,000 kilometers away. No, you're right. I'm ignoring that in this and to properly do it, you need to know how accurately they know their position. I think they know their position fairly accurately. Um, And that distance is so long, 24,000 kilometers, right? Say you're off by a meter. Is that gonna really change the distance much? No. Um, you'd have to be significantly off in that versus time. Time we have a much tighter constraint on given distance because the distance is so long. So you want a, a, a one meter you know, resolution, you need to have three nanoseconds timing accuracy versus a positional accuracy, say to a kilometer of a satellite. I'd say the timing is much more challenging. Those are the thoughts off the top of my head, but I'm happy to continue the conversation by email. To what extent then is the cesium put before the horse? In other words, what is the there? Is there a fixed thing being measured or rather is it a notion ideal benchmarked by the clock? So we've returned to our question of what is physics? Um, my view is that it's models of nature that are useful and we know they're useful because we can make things with it. It's a very functional, utilitarian view, I know. It's not very philosophically satisfying. Sometimes I like to think philosophically, 
but I don't know if I would ever posit there is a there uh, because now you're getting outside the scope of physics. Instead of talking about models, you're talking about philosophy. I studied philosophy for you know four years, nothing against it, but it gives you different answers than physics gives you. You're not gonna be building GPS philosophy. So nothing against it. You might have a fuller life if that's your thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, how does the rotational speed of the earth play into it? That's a very good question. So on the level of, you know, I'm using GPS to get my location in the moment, the earth's essentially stationary. But on the level of, you know, how does the rotation of the earth play into GPS? I'm not sure. I know the biggest issue with GPS is its ability to transmit signals because of space weather. Space weather is when we have a bunch of stuff coming from the sun that messes up our ionosphere. And then it cuts out GPS in most communication with space. I assume that military satellites are built with exceptional distance accuracy. How do they achieve this over the typical time scales for a satellite lifetime? That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know. And I, it would, be, it would be an awkward question for me to speculate on. For nautical use, as in the transatlantic sailing trip I took, oh, that's cool. I wish I had gone, you know, that'd be neat. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't shortchange the 250 meters as much as I did. It has its place definitely in the sea and early versions of GPS, actually APL was involved in an early version of GPS called Transit. Um, that's probably how good Transit was. I shouldn't shortchange it, but if you had to choose, you choose the two and a half meters. When there are solar storms, is GPS thrown off due to interference with transmission? Came from satellites. Yes, it is. It is thrown off. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything systemically thrown off or if it's just its ability to communicate. I think it's just its ability to communicate and that's well known. And that's true about the transatlantic thing. I, I'd like to do that one day too. Um, but yeah, that sounds, yeah, that would be hugely valuable. It's, I, I would really recommend that Scientific American article because um, it talks about how um, navigating the ocean was one of the big pushes for good clocks.